joining us now is Danny McLean. She's a contributor at thenation.com and a fellow at the Nation Institute. Danny, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. It's really good to have you on. So you have a recent piece uh, written for the Nation uh, called Why uh, Black Women Are the Voting Block to Watch uh, in the Midterm Elections. And explain why that is. Help set the conversation for us. Sure. So when you look at, uh, well, for, I mean, kind of to take a look at why this is such an important question to be asking right now, um, you know, there's always concern that folks won't head to the polls, that progressive voters won't head to the polls for midterm elections. Um, there is, particularly with this midterm, according to a recent NBC poll, only about 50% of those polls said that they are highly interested in the midterm election. So there's this general, you know, question about who's actually going to turn out right. to cast, um, you know, to cast their votes, and it's so critical, right, because there's a concern that the Dems may lose uh, the Senate to the Republicans. Uh, right now, I think, there's, according to uh, 538, you know, there's something like a 60% chance that um, the Republicans will gain control of the Senate. So, there, you know, this is, um, yeah, the 538 puts the odds at 61%. Um, according to the New York Times, they're, they're saying there's about a 71% chance that the Republicans will gain control. So who's going to turn out? When you look at um, the 2008 and 2012 elections, you see that black women um, were incredibly uh, reliable voters. They had the highest voter turnout of any segment in the country in both of those in our most recent presidential elections. Um, in 2012, young black women had the highest voter turnout of all young voters between the ages of 18 and 29. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition to, so, so we know that among you know, progressive voters, black women are the most kind of reliable and consistent. And beyond just getting themselves to the polls, <clears throat> there's also the belief that black women are influencers, that you know, in addition to uh, heading out to vote themselves, they make sure that their children vote, that their you know, siblings vote, mm -hmm. that they're, um, you know, they're holding important conversations within their families and communities about the importance of voting. That's really There's interesting. There's also alongside this a concern, you know, because, you know, one of the reasons black folks turned out in such large numbers in such large numbers in 08 and 12 is because many people are incredibly inspired by and motivated by President Obama. So what does it mean, you know, in the midterm that clearly he's not on the ticket, will people be inspired to turn out and vote in um, such large numbers? Right. So there's a, there's a lot there. I want to get um to, you know, I think I think one of the things that definitely has been a problem in terms of framing this midterm is, you know, it, it's there doesn't seem to be a kind of national democratic message you have. And, and part of that does reflect very different realities of the states that candidates are competing in, obviously, to win reelection as a Democrat in Alaska versus North Carolina you know, versus Hawaii are going to mean different right. things. But that said, there still has not really congealed a kind of clear um, message, really, other than maybe, you know, these Republicans are obviously really extreme and really crazy, and you need to sort of come out and sort of hold the line against that. But that said, I mean, and I think specifically when you're talking about the agendas of African-American women or other really key parts of a progressive coalition, one of the things that you really do need is really clear stances on health care, as an example, probably sharpening the focus on and we what we sort of relentlessly advocate for on this show, which is basically, uh, you know, economic populism, progressive economic policies. How is that balance in terms of vo mobilizing black women voters from a message of basically right, without the inspiration of being able to vote for President Obama? And then you're kind of saying, look, you need to go out and vote for maybe some Democrat that you've never even heard of. Or maybe when you have, you've seen them sort of, uh, you know, their politics are not particularly, uh, you know, inspiring or distinct. Um, but you need to vote to hold back like this this really horrible wave of Republicans versus a, a proactive progressive agenda for the midterms, which I mean, I don't think you're really seeing from national Democrats. Are there other organizations that are mobilizing 
uh, black female right. voters that are speaking to those issues? Like, how, how is that being addressed? Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, a, it's an incredibly important point. And um, I've talked to women who are engaged in voter organizing efforts in, let's see, I talked to someone who's in the Detroit area. Um, I talked to someone who's in, the, in Milwaukee, and then I talked to someone who works with Color of Change, which is a national um, racial justice organization that focuses on the black community. And I think one thing that was a consistent, um, you know, message that I heard from all of them is that, you know, what, what matters and what works is being in touch with voters in general, but they're, you know, particularly focused on black women all year round hmm. so that you don't have to come out, you know, three weeks before the election and make a case about why it's important to get to the polls. Instead, for example, I talked to a woman named uh, Sarah Noble, who uh, is the director of something called the Reproductive Justice Collective in Milwaukee. And she and her colleagues have been in touch. You know, they do year-round civic engagement, organizing work. So all year round, you know, they're talking to people in communities, particularly women, um, most recently their, their push has been around uh, education around the Affordable Care Act. Mm. So with changes to who's eligible for Medicaid, they're standing in front of grocery stores. As the, uh, the window starts to close for the enrollment period, they're talking to people about, okay, you may have gotten some kind of complicated information, but you know, here's what you need to be thinking about in terms of you know, where your family falls in terms of income and what you're eligible for. Um, you know, in terms of health insurance. Um, so, and similarly, I talked to someone uh, in the Detroit area who directs a, an organization called Mothering Justice. So you begin to see this commonality around, uh, you know, some of these organizations, based on their names, it may sound like they're focused specifically on reproductive health and on mm. kind of moms, um, but they're really using that opening to have much broader conversations with people about um, political involvement and their families, you know, well-being. The uh, Daniel Atkinson in the Detroit area, you know, they're having conversations with black moms, moms of color throughout Michigan about uh, economic justice issues. So um, affordable child care, um, raising the minimum wage. Um, they just, you know, feel like they've had a victory around that um, you know, recently there in, in Michigan. So they're really focused on the bread and butter issues and, and starting, you know, having, facilitating these conversations all year round so that then when you show up on someone's doorstep in mid-October to encourage them to, to go to the polls on November 4th, it's not the first time that they're meeting you. You know, you've been building a conversation about why political engagement is really bigger than just this one candidate who you may not find particularly motivating. You realize how this candidate is going to connect to these broader issues that you know you care about and that are, you know, really affect your, your family and your, and your community. So I think the key is this idea of year-round civic engagement um, and, and having organizers who see the, the importance of that so that they're not just making an ask of someone on the eve of the election and, you know, expecting that that person is going to show up because it's their civic duty to go to the polls. It's a, it's a bigger conversation than, than that. Right, so that voting and elections are part of, of, of life, really. I mean, not, not just this sort of exceptional event that, well, all of a sudden we're interested in hearing you and your concerns because we literally need you to do something in a couple of weeks. Yeah, I mean, that, that's really right. important. I mean, the, the one other thing I'd like to ask you about is in, you know, specifically in the South, in North Carolina uh, and in Georgia, this Moral Mondays. I mean, is, is, are you right. seeing that? Uh, playing a role, um, like really constructively in mobilizing people in those elections. Yeah, I mean, I think we. I'm really curious. You know, I I spent some time in North Carolina in May um, when the legislative session reopened there in Raleigh uh, because I was curious about how Mortal Mondays was going to continue after all of the great strides that it had made in the summer of 2013. So. Um, I think that's a perfect example of, you know, you have tens of thousands of people who have been mobilized over the course of the past, you know, year and a half around the broader political issues of what does it mean for Republicans to be in control, not just of the governor's mansion, but also both houses of the legislature. And you have this, I mean, I really, it was incredible doing reporting there because these people have really formed these tight kinships. Yeah. 
and really see, you know, themselves as, polit you know, family. And they support one another, and they're having these incredible political conversations and setting an agenda for the future of their state. So, of course, I'm fascinated, you know, very curious to see how that's going to translate into the, um, what's that going to mean for Kay Hagan? Like, how's that going to translate mm -hmm. into what happens um, in the race for the Senate there? Um, so I think Moral Mondays is a, is a great example of kind of, that kind of year-long civic participation in voter education that we're going to see on November 4th, what that, how that translates into activity at the polls. Yeah, and, then, and you know, even beyond that, I think specifically talking about the South and a candidate like Kay Hagan, what's fascinating, too, is, you know, obviously, you know, the South usually has produced these Democratic candidates. There is some kind of history of of some economic populism there. And then there's obviously African-American candidates from different congressional districts. But what's really interesting is Moral Mondays is kind of showing that in some respects, when is that a equation going to flip in the South where someone like Kay Hagan realizes it's actually much more po profitable to sort of like activate this new Southern coalition than spend all my time mm -hmm. trying to ensure, assure a, a more, you know, conservative possible voter in a, in a swing district uh, that I, like, I'm not going to touch his guns or something. Mm -hmm. It might actually be mm -hmm. more relevant in terms of, you know, durable electoral success to see what's happening at Moral Mondays. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it's there yet, but that is where it's going. And then you have the possibility of, you know, the Southern Democratic parties could start being, like, significantly more progressive, maybe even than, than other regional parts of the Democratic Party. It's really interesting. It is. It's fascinating, and I think you make a really good point. I also think it's important to, you know, the Times had a piece over the weekend comparing, <clears throat> um, you know, uh, a Kay Hagan to a Mary Landrieu in terms of how they're running their campaigns, right. talking about Southern Democrats. You know, so uh, at least Kay Hagan, like, stands with Planned Parenthood and, right. you know, talks very openly about being um, in favor of a woman's right to choose and uses that to push back against Tom Tillis and say, this is what, you know, this man has, is clearly anti-choice, and and you know I'm I'm standing by my convictions and by my principles, and I support a woman's right to choose. Versus Mary Landrieu, who has these very kind of nuanced, well, as you know, as the Times put it, you know, she she is certainly kind of backing away from um, taking strong stances uh, on issues like same-sex marriage, um, a lot of choice issues. So I think you you raise a really interesting point. I also think it's important to look at you know the 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 context, the political context in which people are operating and, and how much room they, they may feel like they have to move on these issues. Oh, yeah, no no question about that. Um, you know, the other important thing to definitely raise, obviously, when you're talking about activating you know, black women voters or really any voter uh, from, uh, you know, Hispanic voters, black voters, is, you know, this campaign of voter suppression. We saw over the weekend right. uh, the, Supreme, the Supreme Court uh, overruling an earlier uh, lower court ruling on Texas's voter ID laws. What was fascinating about the first ruling was that, you know, it, it wasn't just struck down because it was a poorly constructed law or something like that. The lower court went broader and said, no, this really is the intention of this bill is to keep certain people from voting. They, it's, you know, it's pretty rare, as you know, that a court would actually say something that bluntly. But this, you know, Supreme Court went along with what its record on voting rights has been, which is completely atrocious uh, and and sort of overturned it and restored uh, what Texas was doing. I guess the theory in 2012, and it seems to have been borne out in some ways, was that because of how aggressive these efforts were, there was backlash uh, in communities that were the, you know, the targets of these voter suppression efforts and people ended up voting in even higher numbers. I guess it's a two-part question of one is, do you think that that's possible that something like that could play out again in the midterms? And then at the same time, you know, more broadly, what, how does the strategy to restore voting rights, uh, you know, fit into to these efforts as well? Yeah. Um, you know, I think I was actually, you know, very interested to, to watch uh, in advance of the 2012 election all of the organizing that happened, incredible organizing on the, the parts of um, uh, civil rights organizations, groups like the Advancement Project, I mean, so many groups just mobilized to call out 
um, you know, voter ID laws, voter, you know, the voter suppressions in Ohio, in uh, Pennsylvania, and I think because of the education they were doing around, this is what this these voter ID laws will mean for you, you know, elderly black woman who doesn't drive, and so you know, like, who doesn't have this particular type of ID, or you know, woman who has changed your name and so has to kind of jump through all of these hoops. To, to locate the records necessary to get this new type of ID. I think you're right. I think there was a kind of um, hyper-awareness around uh, the power of um, the votes of people of color that, that did motivate people and that brought folks out to the, to the polls in large numbers. Um, I don't have the stats in front of me, so I'm kind of just speaking on um, maybe you know, the, my sense of the kind of energy that, that I, that I felt. And that I, I don't have them in front of me either, but I think around. that that was borne out. I yeah. think it was, you know, I do think yeah. that was true. Yeah. Go ahead. And so I think, I think when we look at, um, when we look at what's happening right now, um, you know, I mentioned speaking with Sarah Noble at the Milwaukee Reproductive Justice Collective. One of the ways, I, and I mentioned the work that she and her colleagues have been doing around the Affordable Care Act and educating around that. The other huge piece of their work has been, educating voters around, um, you know, the Wisconsin voter ID law, right. which the Supreme Court, you know, blo they blocked, you know, so you talked about what's happened in Texas, the very sad news of, um, you know, that law being upheld in Wisconsin, um, you know, there's, there's, the Supreme Court has issued an injunction, you know, against the voter ID law there, so it won't go into effect, at least for this election, and the Reproductive Justice Co uh, Collective has been you know, out in uh, canvassing, sending mailings, holding forums, doing emergency phone banks, through this whole process of the legal, you know, ins and outs, telling people what they will need to bring to the polls. And I think, um, you know, that has led to, again, this sense of like, wow, they really must not want us to vote if it's <laughs> this much rigmarole around this. I think similarly, I talked to um, Arisha Hatch, who's a managing director of campaigns at Color of Change, and they are engaging their members in pushing back um, in Georgia and calling on Georgia's Secretary of State to deal with this, you know, 50,000 um, uh, voter registrations that are backlogged, somehow lost. Um, so I think we're seeing some of the same uh, kinds of organizing where people, uh, you know, really want voters to know um, this kind of coordinated effort to put all of these bizarre require requirements and restrictions in place to keep them away from the polls. Absolutely. Well, the, the piece is why black women are the voting block to watch in the midterms. Uh, Danny McLean, she's a contributing writer at thenation.com and a fellow at the Nation Institute. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.